אז קוראים לי טל. Uh, I'm going to deliver the talk in English. I hope you don't mind. Uh, part of our engineering team, our mobile engineering team is overseas, and I want to share the talk with them, so English will be better. We're going to talk about performance uh, of React Native because that's the main thing. I think that's a big elephant in the room. How good does it perform? Um, what I do is I'm working in Wix. I lead the architecture for all the mobile app efforts. Uh, Wix has lots of uh, engineering uh, locations all over the world. Let's dive in. Now, from the dawn of mobile, uh, we've been, people have been talking about cross-platform. Because developing mobile is expensive. And we want to do cross-platform because the benefits are immense. We want to reuse our skills. We want to reuse our code. Uh, we want to reuse the personnel that we have. Um, the bottom line is that cross-platform can make mobile development much more productive. We can develop faster. And that's what we, what we all want to do. Um, and the holy grail of cross-platform development is JavaScript. And why is JavaScript the cross-platform holy grail? That's because JavaScript lets you conquer the biggest three platforms, the most popular three platforms, web, iOS, and Android, supposedly. But this isn't a new concept. We've been hearing about it for a very long time. It didn't catch on uh, in the mainstream. We've been hearing about, um, a, about PhoneGap and Cordova from 2009. We've been hearing about Accelerator from 2009. And all of them were preaching JavaScript. And it's good. Do it. Use it. But it didn't catch on. And the reason is, the blunt reason is shitty apps. But uh, the reason behind the scenes is performance. So performance is critical. If you want to do apps that compete with the best of breed native apps, you need your apps to feel smooth. Now, the biggest question about it, can we reach that with React Native? So React Native, the motto is learn once, write anywhere with React and JavaScript. So you have the productivity that JavaScript brings. The, the pedigree is very promising, because this framework is coming from Facebook. And if there is one company on Earth who know how to do mobile development and scale, that's Facebook. Okay, they have a huge user base. They have the best native developers in the world. And the fact that they're transitioning to a cross-platform language is insane. Okay, they're talking about productivity of their developers. That is becoming the most expensive thing. But the question is, does React Native measure up to purely native apps? So this is a screenshot of our app, the app that uh, Wix is working on. And the first thing that's important to see here in a React Native app, okay, this is pure React Native, is that what you see here is not a web view. You don't see HTML. All the views that you see on screen are purely native views. For example, the navigation is UI navigation controller from iOS. The bar button is UI bar button item. The image view is UI image view. The switch that you see is the, the UI switch, and the, bar, the top bar in the bottom is UI top bar controller. So the UI is native. Okay? You have JavaScript instantiating native views. So that's one check that you have to have. So the question is, where is the JavaScript? If all the UI is native, what does JavaScript do in React Native? So the JavaScript is the driver behind the scenes. That's where you as a developer specify to the system how you want your uh, UI to look like, how do you want the business logic to behave, and then a native driver drives the whole thing and make it happen. So let's dive into React Native and see how, how this thing is working. How is it architected? So the main thing to understand about React Native is that React Native is separated into two different realms. One realm is the JavaScript realm. That's where you develop most of your business code. The other realm is the native realm. That's where you have all the native code running. For example, in iOS, um, it would be all the native threads running in your app. So when you do your JavaScript development, all of this code is running on a single thread in something called a JavaScript core. That's kind of ver not, not really a virtual machine, but a JavaScript engine, just like a browser has. So this engine is also running inside your app. And all of your JavaScript code is running inside. So it's a thread inside your app. In the native realm, you have the regular native threads that you have. You have one UI thread and many background threads. And the thing that's connecting the two is the bridge. The React Native bridge It's a very important concept. What is the developer experience in each realm? So in the JavaScript realm, first of all, you program in JavaScript. That's a language that you use. The thing that you make is one huge JavaScript bundle. It's a text file containing all of your JavaScript code from all of your files bundled together. And this file is basically just an asset inside your binary, just like an image. And the JavaScript engine knows to run it when the app executes. 
And normally speaking, you would put all of your business logic in this side. On the native realm, you develop an Objective-C in Swift if you're doing iOS, or in Java if you're doing Android. And what you make there is an IPA or APK, that's a binary, that you upload to the, to the Google Play Store or to Apple's App Store. And the main thing that's running here is the framework. You don't develop most of your code there. Some small parts, but not most of it. So React Native does most of the heavy lifting in this realm for us. Now let's talk about performance. So when you examine each part of this ar architecture and see how it behaves performance-wise, let's start with a native. Obviously, the native performance is good. Any code that runs in this realm will be blazingly fast. The next part is less obvious, and that's the JavaScript realm. And it turns out the JavaScript is a very fast language. OK, JavaScript has JIT compilers. The code itself is fast. JavaScript talking to JavaScript runs blazingly fast. So there's no performance problem there. So there's a check here. But the missing part is, what about the bridge? Now here comes the big performance problem of any cross, lang any cross uh, technology. The problem is that variables that you define in one realm cannot be accessed in the other realm. The only way to access a variable is to serialize it and send it over the bridge. Serialization is expensive. That's what you do when the client and server speak together over the web. Serialization is slow when it runs inside your app. So the performance of the bridge is poor. OK, that's something important to understand because the key, OK, if, if you take one lesson out of this talk is that the key to React Native performance is to keep passes over the bridge to a minimum. If you do that, your app will behave like a native app. So let's talk about the obvious pitfalls. That's where most of the competition lost the battle. We're talking about um, solutions like, I'm, I'm going to talk about Accelerator, not about PhoneGap, because PhoneGap, the UI was native fully. So, but in Accelerator, the UI is native. It's a very, very similar concept. But it didn't work. It didn't, wor it didn't perform as good. And the problem is, the, the biggest pitfall is when you, when you update one realm, wants to update another, the update is synchronous. Now, why is, is it obvious to implement everything synchronous? Because we want to have consistency. Imagine that you have your business logic in JavaScript, and the business logic is telling a button to be enabled. And then after a second, the native needs to handle this command and actually turn the button to enabled, because the button lives in the native realm. And then a second later, you want the JavaScript to do something else to the button. And the JavaScript has to know that it's enabled or disabled. So you can't have the JavaScript continue running until the native side is synchronized. So to keep consistency, the, the pitfall is to do the updates synchronously, and that's very, very slow. It kills performance completely. So let's see what React Native does for this problem out of the box. And the surprising thing is that React Native handles this amazingly well. This is actually, it goes back to React itself. I don't know if any of you worked with React on the web, but React on the web solves a very similar problem, a very similar performance problem. Because on the web, you have essentially the same problem. You have JavaScript running and updating the DOM. And the DOM is a native construct. And the updates are synchronous. Until the DOM natively updates, the JavaScript can continue running. So one of the huge performance impacts that React.js on the web did is allowing um, JavaScript to update a shadow DOM. So JavaScript is updating JavaScript. And that's how consistency is maintained. And you have something running asynchronously taking all of those updates and batching them to the native at once. This is a very similar optimization to double buffering in gaming, if any of you are familiar with that. This allows all the updates to be asynchronous. This allows the JavaScript thread not to block until the native thread uh, accepts the updates. And that's one of the main keys to why React Native performs so well. But this is the obvious optimization. I want to show you a case where, where all this breaks down completely. On, on an ordinary case, and then let's explore what you do. Because the happy, flow, the happy flow is happy. Now let's see what happens to something that is immune to this optimization. So the example that I want to show you is something very simple. OK, uh, a card that you swipe. That's very, something very obvious to do. For example, the Google Now app has this uh, UX. And what I want to happen is when I swipe the card with my finger, I want it to become, uh, I want to have the transparency increase, and I want to have a translation. I want to move it to the right. So that's something simple. I want this to be performant. 
So let's look at the code, how you would implement that in React Native. And I'll just talk about the JS6 very, very quickly. And you see that I've separated the container itself that does all the swipe behavior and the opacity behavior from the content itself. So I have the swipeable component, which handles the behavior. And I have the content itself, which is a different component, which is a child. So let's ignore the child and talk about the swipeable component and see how you would implement that and how it would behave. So the naive approach would naturally to, to implement this in JavaScript, of course. I want to write all of my business logic in JavaScript and React Native. That's the point. That's where the productivity comes from. So I won't dive into this code. To, uh, you, you can see it later. But the concept to do this in JavaScript is to define some sort of a pen responder that listens on touch events. And every time a touch events come to the JavaScript side, I'm going to see where the x location of the touch event is. And according to that, I'm going to calculate my new opacity, my new x translation, and I'm going to set state, re-render, and move the container. So that's the obvious implementation with JavaScript. So it makes sense, and it's very easy to do. But here is the pitfall. When this happens, Dada crosses the bridge on every frame. The entire optimization that React does for us is to minimize passes over the bridge by batching and doing the updates asynchronously. But what happens here? As my finger is moving, obviously you can see that the event, the touch event itself, is a native event. It originates from native, the location of my finger. So for every frame, I need to move, I need to transfer this data to the JavaScript, calculate the new opacity and the new X translation, update the state, and send it back. So I have data crossing the bridge for every animation frame of this behavior. Now, if you expect this to run silky smooth in 60 frames per second, that's not what you'll get. So what do you do when something like this happens? And this is a pretty obvious scenario. So let's start by pulling out the big guns. In React Native, there is an amazing architecture idea, architectural idea, that you can take any component that you want and move it seamlessly from JavaScript to Native. I can take any component I want and instead of implementing it in JavaScript, I can implement only this component in native, which is amazing because it allows me to take problems and solve them with the, with the big guns that I have, which is native development. Now, you could have basically a JavaScript component containing a native component, containing a JavaScript component, containing a native component. Okay, the, the platform can handle this very, very easily. So how can we use this idea to reduce the bridge traffic and improve performance? So what we'll do is we'll focus on the container, on the swipeable component. We don't care about the content itself. We want to define the content in JavaScript because it's easy, it's fast, it's productive. The problem was with the behaviors, and the behaviors were implemented in the swipeable component. So let's take just this component and implement it natively. Let's pull it out from JavaScript and implement it as a native module. It's very easy to do. You do it in the same project. And you would get a code that is surprisingly at the same length of what we had in JavaScript, but this code would be in Objective-C. So I've implemented it here. It actually works very similarly. You define a pen responder. You have an event. It does the same thing. You get the touch events. You do the same calculation. And you set the containers view X translation and opacity according to this. So the implementation is pretty much identical, but the language itself was different. So as you can see, what I did is I moved it to handle the, native, the events in native. Now, what did this do? I took the part that was very noisy over the bridge, the part about touch events and the calculation, and I, I'm doing it in native. And for now, I don't need to cross the bridge for every frame. On every animation frame, I stay on the native side. And this will give me 60 frames per second performance. So this is a great solution. It's very promising, because you know that if you're going to hit a wall, a performance wall, you can, you can cross it by just moving some little parts to native. So that's a very good idea. But this is not ideal. We can do better. And the reason that this is not ideal is because we need a native skill set to fix this. And that's a problem, because what React Native promises us is productivity. And this is not productive. If you don't know native, it's OK. You can rely on open source. You have many people who have native skills, and they're open sourcing components that do these things and solve these performance issues. What we do in Wix, for example, is we, we have about 200 front-end developers in Wix. And our ideal is to take about 10% and, and have native developers. Uh, so we would have, for example, for these 200, about 20 native developers. So you can do the same thing in your teams. If you have 10 front-end developers, take one native guy. So that's one way to approach it. And, and this is another important lesson that I want you to take from this talk. And that's that React Native doesn't mean the end of native. You are still doing native, just doing less of it and concentrating your native efforts on the important parts.
Let's solve this in a different way. The holy grail would to solve such a problem from JavaScript purely. And this is not easy. And the code that, that's running here, I'll explain it uh, shortly, uh, is doing a very interesting concept. What it's doing is I'm taking the same pan responder and hooking it up to the same touch event. And what I'm doing is I'm defining an interpolation of how I want to connect the x location of the touch event to the opacity and, and to the uh, x translation. What it does is what I'm basically I'm declaring how I want my interaction to behave. I'm not calculating it on every frame. I'm just saying in advance, I want this to behave this way, the entire thing. Now, the declarative nature of React allows us to do such things. And what this allows us to do is to declare the interaction, to declare the behavior in JavaScript, and then serialize this entire declaration, this explanation of how I want the interaction to behave, and move this interaction, the declaration of, how, of the behavior, once over the bridge to the native side, and in the native side, I will have a generic native driver that knows how to handle this interaction and handle the frame by frame basis. So what this will do, I will offload all the day to day work, all the frame to frame work to native, but I will define the interaction in JavaScript in advance. Now these APIs, they're not there yet. They're just emerging. What I've used here is the animated library. It's a new library from Facebook to do animations, and that's what it does. When you want something to move from one point to another, you, just, you don't do it frame by frame. You say, I want this object to move from x to uh, x2, and it's going to take it, uh, I don't know, t two seconds, and then let the native do its thing. So the future is of React Native is solving more and more scenarios without native code. And the way to do it is to invent JavaScript API that is designed to reduce passes over the bridge to a minimum. And the declarative nature of React is a big help to do it. Now, this can solve anything. It's not, it can solve everything. But it can solve many, many day-to-day -day problems. Now, you have access uh, to all the code that I've showed you here uh, in our public GitHub. It's called RN Performance Experiments. And there is a very interesting example app in there that takes the swipeable component that I've showed you, and it implements it four times. The first time it implements it with a naive approach, completely in JavaScript, so you can see how it works. The second time it implements it with something I didn't talk about, which is called direct manipulation. It's not that interesting. But the third implementation is a purely native implementation. And the last implementation is with the animated library to do it declaratively. Now, what you can see there, there are, um, you can turn a few flags there that make the app noisy over the bridge to simulate that you're doing other things. And you can actually feel how the smoothness of the behavior changes and starts to jitter between implementations. So I urge you to do it. And I'm pretty much done.